So, um, welcome uh, again to the people in presence and uh, all the participants online. And uh, I chair this uh, last session of these two intensive days. Uh, okay, and uh, we have a I think a very interesting panel this afternoon. Focus on different perspectives and fields that are involved in our uh, discussion concerning engineering life, ethics of engineering life. Um, the first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Jacques Simporé. Um, she is uh, uh, online because uh, he had a, some problem to travel uh, uh, to Italy, to Rome, and um, is a, a genetist, and uh, he has a, also a very important experience at the international level uh, concerning uh, genetic issue and uh, a role in the WHO organization in uh, Geneva. Uh, Jacques uh, Simporé, I remember also for each speaker, there is a 15 minutes time, and uh, after the presentation, five, seven, eight minutes of uh, uh, discussion in presence and also online by chat. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, Professor Simporé is uh, connected. I don't see, or, or, or is, uh, okay. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Professor Simporé. So, welcome. And uh, I have introduced uh, you briefly. Uh, and you can start your presentation about the issue of governance. What is the meaning? And... Uh, of governance about these new technologies and uh, ethics of engineering life. Okay, please uh, excuse me, uh, Professor uh, Sempore is absent because... Uh, in fact, you are not a Sempore, in fact. <laughs> uh, I'm not Sempore, yes. You, uh, he has been uh, is a, by... Is a modification, what is... A... Uh, Alma is an uh, assistant. Uh, so assistant is... A digital twin. We discussed a digital twin this morning. Uh, yes. So many thanks, uh, uh, assistant. So your name is? Uh, Dr. Abdul Karim Ouattara. I, I have renounced to pronounce. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And so uh, please, uh, uh, thank you for your help. And uh, if you can uh, present uh, this uh, uh, lecture, please. Okay, thank you. I will go ahead. Good. Okay. Do yes. you see my do you see my screen? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. So the presentation is about uh, ethical requirements for global governance and oversight of genome editing. In introductions, we could say that uh, nowadays, the invention of new generation sequencer that allow the sequencing of animal, plant, and microbial genomes uh, from animal, plant, uh, and microbial, we can uh, found chromosome, chromosome which were uh, DNA, and we can extract DNA to sequence uh, the DNA in order to obtain uh, the order of the nucleotide which compose DNA. So, plant genome and CRISPR-Cas9 technology which allow editing, manipulating at will any part of the DNA or RNA of organism, opens up 
new and deeper ways of understanding living organisms. The objective of this sequencing and genetic manipulation of the genomes of living beings are first producing genetically modified plants and animals for food, applying predictive medicine through DNA testing, treating genetic diseases, gene therapy, produce medicine, fight against pathogens, improving nature conservation, increase the potential of human being, of homo sapiens, in short, to offer well-being to people. Of course, the, possibility, the possibilities offered by these technologies are fascinating, but it must be recognized that they are fraught with potential risk for human and their environments. Hence, the skepticism, mistrust, and fears that haunt the mind of civil society, religious communities, politicians, and above all, the researchers themselves who use technologies of which they are unaware. Shouldn't there be a moratorium, a global governance of application of genome editing of living organisms? The presentation will be proceed according to three main points. First, potential benefits from the application of genome editing technology. Second, potential risk of applying genome editing technology. And third, ethical requirement for global governance of application of genome editing technologies. First point, Benefits today, NGS sequencing and genome editing offer unprecedented opportunities for humans in the field of genetic engineering and modern biotechnology, and their applications are varied. NGS sequencing makes it possible to know the primary structure of all the genome, genomic DNA of any living organism and to identify it. For example, the genetic sequences of the organism phenotypic trait, their genetic sequences of regulation, susceptibility, predispositions, resistance, and so on. Thanks to the precision of genomic sequencing today, more than 8,000 genetic diseases have been cataloged. And we can accurately determine their loss in the genome. And based on this knowledge, researcher will carry out genetic manipulation to correct deficiency genes or improve those that do not have a good genetic expression. The figure on the right side shows some genetic diseases are located in chromosomes. Application of genome editing technique. So application of genome editing technique could be applied to medicine for drug development or gen surgery, to biology, to animal model and genetic variation or in biotechnology for food, biofuel and other materials. So application of uh, genome editing could be also applied to agronomy. It is possible to inactivate, for example, in maize, the genes for susceptibility to the European corn borer. In breeding, it is possible to transmit muscle growth genes or resistance gene to species threatened by viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so on. The gene drive technique, genetic forcing, could make it possible to completely eradicate certain species, such as Anophel, Gambier, and IBS, which transmit disease such as malaria, which is endemic in our country, then Zika, and so on. Application of genome 
editing would allow manipulation of somatic cells to treat genetic disease such as sickle cell anemia, which is also prevalent in Burkina Faso, cystic fibrosis, cancer, Duchenne, Huntington, and Parkinson disease. Manipulation of human cell to enhance a human's capability, physical augmentation, musculature, hate choice of eye or hair color, longevity, or potentiate memory by stimulating synaptogenesis and connectomy, also to produce increasingly targeted and specific biomedicine. However, in all of this, we do not know the long-term consequences of genome editing on species, on ecosystems, and even on food. So for the second part, Potential risk of make, managing masses of sequencing data through bioinformatics and edit, editing of organism genomes. All this massive data, big data, generated by sequencing and managed by bioinformatics can be asked by computer hackers to be disclosed to the general public, to be sold to companies that have no faith, no law, and no ethics. Such inappropriate disclosures can lead to discrimination against people who carry morbid genes and to problems with hiring, marriage, heredity, health insurance, and so on. Genome editing techniques are sometimes imprecise and controllable and could cause unexpected and unpredictable effects. During genome editing, genetic errors such as on target and off target effects could be made, leading to an expected manipulation result. Off target effects would be an intended modification at site in the genome other than the intended one, where any unintended modification could lead to an intended consequences for the living organism. So in third part, what is the ethical requirement for global governance of techniques for manipulating the living organism genomes? There is no such thing as zero risk in the application of these new technologies. On the level of human genome sequencing, there are ethical uses related to occurs of the data generated by bioinformatics and the consequences thereof. I can't say that I won't buy a car because there are thieves, or that I won't put my money in bank because the same hackers operate there periodically. Above all, the searcher will have to take steps to avoid the hacks and disclosure of human sequencing that data. What will happen? if genome editing becomes safe and effective in the embryo? Will it be possible to modify the genome according to the parents' wishes? According to Prof. Hervé Schneeways, chairman of the INSERM ethics committee, in the long term, if CRISPR-Cas technique becomes effective and reliable in embryo, it could be used in a rare and very specific indication. In, view, in his view, it will be used to prevent the transmission of a serious disease when both parents have it, and there is 100% risk of giving birth to a sick child. It will then be a matter of correcting the mutation in the embryo. Genome editing could also lead to unprecedented possibility that raise ethical, ethical questions. <clears throat> Good governance of human genome editing is based on values and rules that govern processes that ensure transparency, inclusive participation, and responsiveness. According to the World Health Organization, 
Governance is not limited to formal mechanisms such as legislation, regulations, or law cases. It also includes future such as ethical, social, and professional standards and, uh, and other elements that influence its development. According to the World Health Organization, human genome editing is a technology that can be used to increase knowledge, improve human health, and contribute to both collective well-being and the common good to maximize the positive impact and limit the potential harm of this technology, policy and practice must be value-based, such as transparency, honesty, prudence, equity, social justice, inclusion, non-discrimination, respect of people, solidarity, accountability, responsible regulatory management, and responsible science management. To conclude, we could say that advances in scientific, in synthetic biology, such as the CRISPR-Cas9 method, make it possible to edit the human genome with unprecedented decision. Thus, progressively, the cursor of progress is moving inexorable towards unknown frontiers of science and nanobiotechnology. It is no longer just a question of curing or repairing man, but of augmenting him, making him immortal to ultimately build, build a more powerful individual, like a cyborg. Thus, human genome editing rises, raises enormous legal and ethical challenges that will still need to be governed by discussion. I'm sorry, concluded. Hello, Professor. Are you hearing me? I don't know if the connection or the link is still working. Is he online or no? I don't uh, So 15 minutes, stop it. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, so it concluded, uh, uh, there is, uh, you don't know Alexander. So uh, we'll see later if uh, it's possible to connect again and if uh, we have uh, the possibility of some question or discussion. Uh, thank you very much uh, and many thanks to also to Professor uh, Simpore and uh, Thanks for the presentation and the, and the connection. So I hope that they can hear the... Uh, and so uh, now I introduce uh, the second voice, the patient's view. Uh, is Jack Janssen from Netherlands. Uh, you can introduce yourself and uh, your experience uh, about a specific uh, disease and gene therapy. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, ik ben uh, Jack Janssen. I'm, uh, I'm not an, a scientist. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I just have a, a daughter with a serious disease. Uh, I'm here because of the secretary of the board of the Dutch Najjar Foundation. It's a foundation which is uh, founded by patients, and the goal of the foundation is to, uh, uh, to support research and to, to raise money for the research. Well, wh what's it all about? It's all about the curriculum Najjar syndrome. Um, that's a, a genetic defect. Uh, one of my genes is defect. 
uh, the, the mother of my daughter, she also have, has, uh, does have a defect, and my daughter has both defects, and uh, I don't have a problem, her mother doesn't have a problem, but my daughter has a serious problem. She is not able to break down Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin is a, a, a byproduct when, uh, when blood is uh, at the end of his age, when blood cells are broken down. Uh, Billy Rubin uh, exists in the, in the body and uh, because she can't break it down, her, the bilirubin level in her body rises. And that's a serious problem because it's, uh, it's, it's mortal. Uh, when the level gets too high, her brain does get affected, uh, functions uh, will fail, she, she, she won't be able to hear anymore, to move anymore, and ultimately uh, death. Uh, some newborns uh, do have the same problem uh, when the, the liver is not working uh, uh, right and uh, uh, when it n is not discovered in time uh, by the doctor, then uh, yeah, they will die. Um, on the picture you can see uh, a twin. Uh, one of half of the twins uh, does have the Crickland and Ajar syndrome and you can immediately see which half it is uh, because it's the, the baby with, uh, uh, with the jaundice. Uh, Billy Rubin is, is, uh, does have a very uh, bright yellow color and it uh, causes uh, 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 yellow skin with the patients and uh, the, the white of the eyes is very yellowish. The only treatment, uh, the only cure right now is a liver transplant, but that's quite a thing because she's as healthy as can be. And uh, she only does have the problem with the Billy Rubin. Um, we're lucky that in the 50s uh, in England by a, a, a sweet nurse was discovered that uh, when babies uh, got in the light, the, the jaundice disappeared. And uh, although uh, that has been uh, known for years now, uh, there is still no equipment available for elderly people. For newborn, there is. All hospitals uh, do have uh, blue lights for uh, treating newborns. But uh, for elderly people, for, for chi children and, and adults, there's no uh, equipment available. Uh, blue light is very important because the bilirubin breaks down under the influence of blue light. That's the only way now to uh, treat patients besides uh, a liver transplant. Um, how did we get here? Let's go back in time. And uh, the, although Crickland and Najar patients do need uh, intensive blue light phototherapy, uh, there are no manufacturers which uh, manufacture this kind of equipment. And probably because it's a very rare disease, they, it's commercially uh, no, no, not any uh, interest. Uh, so there are no blue lights for, for patients. And uh, what to do is that uh, the, the caretakers of patients, they manufacture uh, some kind of uh, uh, light themselves. And uh, in the past, they used fluorescence tubes. Uh, Philips is one of the manufacturers of tubes which only uh, produce blue light. And uh, this uh, was uh, mainly used in uh, tube systems which are based on a tanning bed. You can see it on the, on the picture. 
uh, that's uh, well about uh, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, uh, and uh, you can see it, it is a very large and, and heavy device. Um, there, al although systems were characterized by improvised solutions, note the, the chipboard uh, support frame for the, for the lights. Uh, it, it looks like a cage, uh, it's completely enclosed. Uh, the, 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 the child has uh, very limited space. Uh, this is another example, uh, also with uh, very heavy support frames to, uh, to carry the weight of the, of the lamps. Sometimes, sometimes multiple units are used. Uh, people were searching for solutions uh, I think a better use this phone over here. Yeah. Um, straightforward solutions, uh, because yeah, how to how to uh, take care of uh, of a child with uh, with this uh, disease. When you look at the bed, there's uh, uh, there are tubes underneath. And they go up. Uh, some uh, some people uh, were thinking out of the box. Uh, all in all, um, although systems were very large, heavy, and took a, a lot of volume. Um, nowadays, we can use LEDs. That uh, is a new new technology, existing for for years. And it, it offered new chances. The largest advantage was uh, the irradiation contains no irrelevant wavelength instead of the, 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 the fluorescence tubes. The fluorescence tubes uh, are blue light, but they also have uh, UV uh, parts in it. And LEDs don't. They only have one wavelength, and that's it. Um, the first uh, LED applications were tanning bed look-alike, like this. It's also where, uh, also again, a uh, very heavy uh, support frame, uh, large uh, power supplies. Uh, some even had a, a power cabinet for the LED uh, current uh, over 50 kilograms. And uh, well, that's not uh, uh, state of the art. We uh, uh, were using such a system ourselves uh, and we were not happy with it. Uh, and we were thinking, how can we do it better? Uh, modern technology uh, should offer us uh, a, a user-friendly solution. And uh, my, my brother, my father, and me, uh, we thought about it. And we said, well, uh, let's, let's uh, produce uh, uh, a good system. Uh, you can ask if it's ethical acceptable to put your child in a cage like we saw. Uh, that can be better. And so we, we, we thought about it and uh, we, we constructed a light which uh, does do the job properly and looks a lot better. This is the solution for, uh, for babies. The, the light is integrated at the top of the four-poster bed and uh, the, the child uh, does have uh, enough room uh, beneath the light. It's a, it's a kind of stealth design. You, it's invisible, uh, almost invisible. It's, it's silent. 
but it does do the job. It does have a very good blue light intensity. This bed is uh, suitable for, for babies and toddlers. Um, when children rise, you don't look, you, you don't want that the, the, the child room is uh, looking like an, an engine room. Uh, that's uh, not the case anymore because now we do have this solution. Again, it's fully integrated in the, the top of the bed. Um, it's a, it's a full-size bed, did this, and uh, when you uh, put the light on, it looks like this. By the way, this is my daughter. It offers uh, freedom of movement, easy access, and uh, enough uh, blue light. For adults, you, we do have a ceiling-mounted uh, solution and uh, with the same, uh, the same light, of course. Um, summary, uh, user-friendly systems, less large than tube systems, but they're still difficult to move. Uh, are they suitable for traveling? No. Our husband time? A few minutes. Oh. Few minutes. Okay. Then, yeah. the, then I'll skip uh, and I'll tell about uh, the QCN program. Um, right now, there's a gene therapy trial running uh, because uh, uh, scientists think uh, it, it's possible to uh, to treat uh, this uh, defect, this genetic defect, and uh, a trial is running. Uh, that's that's where we met uh, uh, medical uh, hospitals in uh, in Italy, France, and and Holland. Holland. They developed uh, a, a, a gene treatment. And it's uh, it's uh, used by patients now. Uh, several patients has been treated, and uh, although the first results were not what we uh, wanted to see, uh, the last results are, are better, and uh, it is proved that a gene treatment works. It gives a, an improvement for the for the life, and uh, yeah, it's, you, you can ask if it's uh, ethical, acceptable to, uh, to, to have this phototherapy, because the patients, they do have to sleep under the light whole night, about eight hours, so that the, the light affects the skin and the bilirubin in the skin breaks down and uh, leaves the, the body on a natural way. Uh, well, when, when you're treated with gene therapy, uh, phototherapy is not possible anymore and you're, you're, you're free to go. That's what I like to Thank you. say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this perspective, for this uh, The view coming from a father, from a family, uh, this uh, rare but present disease and in which way gene therapy could uh, help to resolve the problem. Of, co of course, it is the first step of the project because uh, they spent a uh, uh, long time to define the vector and uh, uh, the kind of uh, therapy uh, for this. Uh, I know uh, a little bit of the project because I am an advisory board of uh, this uh, European project uh, of this therapy. That is also very interesting because uh, the patients' association were involved from the beginning in the project. They are partner of the European project, supported by European Union. And there are three associations of patients, the Dutch, the Italian, and the French that are partners active in the project. So it's very, very uh, interesting uh, issue. 
I think it's probably one of the first experiences like that with the patients include uh, uh, as uh, stakeholders and partners in the project. But uh, please, I'm sorry, uh, if there are questions or if you like uh, to clarify, please. Uh, uh. Hi, Jack. Sorry, it's Jen. Hi. I just wondered what was the cost of developing that system, those systems, and what would that be versus a gene therapy? Um, yeah, the cost of developing the system, um, we did it in our, our, our free spare time. So we, we didn't actually have any cost besides the hardware. And uh, because there is no equipment available for patients, uh, we were asked to uh, produce such a device for other patients too. We started with only my daughter, but other patients got interested and they asked us to produce a device. So uh, nowadays we do produce them and uh, they, the, the cost is uh, between 10 and 20,000 euros. But that's a very great problem because uh, we're, we're not a, a real uh, uh, medical equipment manufacturer and who's going to pay it? The, the uh, health assurance says, oh, and the hospital uh, sometimes says, oh, no, you're not a, a, a certified producer. So, uh, and, and I, we like to, 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 to share our equipment with all patients in the world, but we can't afford it. They, they, they've got to, to pay for it. And so that's, that's very, very, uh, very large problem. Yeah. Yes, not a question, uh, but uh, just a remark, Jack. Thank you very much for, for your uh, input. I think this uh, emphasizes once again the important role of including patients and, and uh, patient representatives into our discussion because what you just said and what others uh, will probably also say will in increase the amount of, of knowledge that we need to come up uh, uh, in the, uh, with, with answers in this discussion. So I think this is a very, very good example that you gave how important it is for us from the scientific and ethical side to keep that door open. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe one thing. Uh, in all those presentations during the last days, um, almost every presentation had some uh, uh, subject in it where we have to deal with uh, who's going to pay for it, uh, how to transfer it from, 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 from the, the laboratory to the, to the bedside. Uh, in the laboratory, they discovered how to do phototherapy to the bedside, yeah, only for newborns. So, so much uh, information last days and, and yeah, to, things to recognize as a patient, yeah. Thanks for all. Thank you again for the, this uh, presentation, this uh, perspective coming from the patient. And so when we have uh, to take into account the concrete problems of the family and the patient, it is very important in the uh, cooperation uh, between scientists and the society in this uh, perspective. But the next uh, speaker comes from the medical perspective, medical approach, is uh, Hendrik Skoll from uh, Basel, and uh, please, if you introduce yourself and your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Ralf Stutzki from the Institute of Biomedical Ethics in Basel and the leadership of the NCCR, Engineering Molecular Systems, especially Dr. Daniel Müller for the invitation to speak at this meeting. And I would like to thank the members of the Pontifical Academy for Life for their hospitality and the honor to participate in this meeting uh, at the Vatican. My name is Hendrik Scholl. I'm the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Basel, Switzerland, and also together with Boton Droska, the founding and scientific director of the Institute of Molecular and Clinical Ophthalmology, Basel, or briefly IOB. 
I'm a retina specialist by training, maybe of relevance for, for the meeting. I uh, studied philosophy in parallel with medicine and uh, have a, a master in philosophy, master of arts in philosophy, so I have uh, quite some interest in the, in the topics we are discussing. I'd like to start uh, with the fact um, that ophthalmic disease and vision impairment uh, uh, poses a challenge for society. There was a survey in the United States where uh, a large sample of uh, unaffected people were asked, what's the worst condition that you could imagine? And you can see the responses here on the slide, and you see that blindness was rated the highest together with Alzheimer's disease and cancer, pretty much equal, but uh, by far higher than, for example, HIV, loss of a limb, heart disease, arthritis, and deafness. The picture becomes even clearer when um, we look into the conditions with the greatest effect on day-to-day -day life. So when people were asked, what's the worst condition that you can imagine with the greatest impact uh, to your day-to-day -day life activities, it was by far losing eyesight, followed by losing memory, then losing a limb, losing speech, and losing hearing. At the same time, what we experience is a, uh, a tremendous increase in vision impairment and blindness worldwide. This is data from the WHO over the last uh, three decades, and then a projection for the next three decades. And what we find is a significant increase in the rate of blindness in the world. This is shown in the blue line. And uh, the red line shows uh, the increase in prevalence worldwide of people that are moderately to severely uh, vision impaired. The eye, in fact, is the leading organ and the retina is the leading tissue affected by genetic diseases and brings us to the topic that we would like to discuss. Um, namely gene editing and developing therapies for such, such conditions. A little bit of anatomy, um, that's what I'm dealing with every day as an, as an eye doctor, as an ophthalmologist. So this is a, a cut through the eye. Um, light would enter the eye on the left, would then penetrate the cornea, the anterior chamber, the lens, the vitreous, and would then hit the retina. Keep in mind, all these tissues are transparent, which is a miracle by nature in the first place, that nature is able to produce these tissues in a, in a transparent way, and they stay transparent for decades. And then light hits the retina, and this, as Potonowska explained this morning, hits this wonderful computer that uh, in initiates the first steps of vision. But unfortunately, it is the retina that is so much affected by inherited eye diseases. Here we see the evolution of uh, finding disease genes that, if mutated, give rise to a uh, retinal disease. Uh, and we are currently left with 280 genes that, if mutated, lead to retinal degenerative diseases. Not only that, and that is uh, research that was conducted at IOB, the group of Carlo Revolta, found that uh, not only there are five and a half million people affected by autosomal recessive disease alone, uh, and the genetic prevalence is actually not longer a rare disease. It is more prevalent than one in 2,000. It's actually one case in about 1,400 individuals. But since we talk here about recessive disease, meaning that you need to inherit two mutations at the same time, and carrying one mutation would not lead to the disease, he came up with a somewhat unexpected finding that 2.7 billion people worldwide, more than a third of the world population, is a healthy carrier of at least one mutation that would lead to an autosomal recessive disease if a second mutation would be inherited. So more than a third of all people in the world carry at least one mutation that would lead to a very severe retinal degenerative disease. So now we get to therapy, and there are a couple of therapy approaches that we can look into. They are shown on that slide. So along the x-axis, we have progressive photoreceptor degeneration, meaning photoreceptors are the cells that are able to see. If they still exist, you can apply some approaches. If they are not longer available, you have to apply other approaches. In the case there are still available, gene replacement therap therapy, pharmacotherapy, neuroprotection would be applicable. If they are no longer, no longer available, we would look into uh, therapy approaches such as optogenetics, which we are actively 
um, developing at IOB retinal prosthesis or stem cell therapy. So let's talk a little bit about uh, gene therapy for the eye. This is a complex slide, admittedly, but uh, bear with me for a minute. This is the full receptor cell on top in the uh, RPE cell in the bottom. This is the best studied process in the human body, the regeneration of the photopigment and the phototransduction. So in the upper right, there's the phototransduction where uh, this molecule, 11 uh, cis retinal, is hit by light, and this starts a physical chemical process that eventually leads to the perception of light. So keep in mind, this is our connection to the world our connection to the world, this chemical process where a photon hits this molecule. This initiates vision. But this molecule needs to be regenerated and because we need the molecule again in order to see again. And this regeneration process is called the visual cycle. The visual cycle means that this photopigment is regenerated and there are a couple of players in the visual cycle. For example, an enzyme called RPE65, and if RPE65 is mutated, that means the photopigment cannot uh, longer be regenerated, and the patient suffers from severe visual dysfunction, and then later also retinal degeneration. And I would like to show a video of a patient of mine who is actually affected by mutations in the gene and suffers from a condition that we call retinitis pigmentosa. And now I believe we need... I'm not sure if this can be heard, but we have... Farben ist ähm, schwierig für mich. Die Farben, die ich sehe, sind orange und gelb. Probleme kriege ich dann bei rot, grün, blau. Also zum Beispiel, wenn ich jetzt Uno spiele, das Spiel, das Kartenspiel, dann würde ich das echt nicht erkennen, wenn das jetzt nicht in Blindenschrift eingeschrieben ist. Also wenn ich ein Bild anschauen wollte, ich habe es immer ein bisschen mehr rangehalten, damit ich es erkennen konnte. Also ich habe es verkehrt rum angeguckt. Zentral eher bei mir ist ein Ausfall bei mir, das Zentrale. Sehen und ganz außen ist auch weg. Wenn ich zum Beispiel nach rechts gucken möchte, dann muss ich wirklich den Kopf äh, drehen, damit ich wirklich den Punkt sehe. Oder wenn eine Person mir gegenüber sitzt, dann sehe ich ähm, das Gesicht als Gesicht für mich so. Die Nase sehe ich, aber die, die Augen, ich sehe jetzt nicht die Augenfarbe so zum Beispiel. So. Details kann ich halt nicht erkennen. Wenn ich jetzt einen, zum Beispiel einen Baum angucke, dann, ist, dann sehe ich einfach zuerst mal, wie die Silhouette des Baumes und ich sehe, dass es Blätter dran hat, aber ich sehe die einzelnen Blätter nicht. Ich kann es auch so erklären, es ist wie, als hätte man vor, dem, vor den Augen, so, als hätte man Salatblätter vor den Augen. Und zwischen den Salatblättern ist eben so ein Punkt, da sehe ich was. Also am Anfang war es wirklich schwierig für mich, mit dem Blindenstock rumzulaufen, weil ich dachte mir, oh, und ich sehe das ja, ich sehe ja, wie die Straße kommt oder das ein Fußgängerstreifen. Ja, das, da liegen so die Schwierigkeiten. Aber sonst geht alles. It took pretty much exactly two decades to develop gene therapy for the condition. Ten years of preclinical research in 1997 where the gene was actually discovered to cause such, such a disease. Uh, it was then cloned into, into mice uh, and it was found that a, a natural occurring dog is also affected by the condition. And then in 2007 the first clinical trials were, were initiated. The first readout was in 2010 where three groups found two in Philadelphia, one in London, that with a gene augmentation therapy that disease can be, can be treated, almost cured. And then a phase three clinical trial was initiated in 2012 uh, with a readout in 2015. In 2016, the data were submitted to the um, FDA in the United States and the therapy was approved December 17 in the year 2017 and later was approved uh, in Europe uh, in 2018. This just shows the design of the clinical trial. I, I'm not going to, uh, into the details, but it, uh, it shows that 
pretty much exactly 20, 20 people, 21 people exactly were treated with, with um, a subretinal injection uh, underneath the retina in order to get this new, this healthy gene to the affected, to the affected retina. The, the control group was then crossed over and was also treated, but the, the primary endpoint uh, that was uh, uh, judged by the FDA to approve the therapy was after one year uh, and the functional benefit these patients uh, experienced, uh, namely 21 patients that experienced an improvement of three lock units uh, in uh, light sensitivity, which means a thousand-fold better light sensitivity. When I say an injection underneath the retina, this is, an, um, an, uh, this is euphemistic. Uh, it's not an injection, it's a full operation. I show you uh, the first operation that was done in Switzerland um, that we performed in Basel. So we see here that the ports are being injected into the eye. The eye is completely stable, there's no suture. So now we are with our light pipe in the eye. The surgeon uh, is, uh, is having a retractor in that case here in the left hand. Now we, we go with the cannula to the retina. So we see a 100 second video here uh, of, a, uh, of, an, of a surgical procedure that was pretty much exactly 30 minutes. Um, so now the, um, there's a blep forming. It's a, it's a blep underneath the retina. We can verify that by intraoperative OCT imaging. We see here this, this, these so-called OCT images to the right where the surgeon can see live an OCT image, by the way, OCT imaging has a hundred times the resolution of the best MRI or CT that is available because it goes through optic media, so we see the blep forming while we're operating. And at the end of the surgery, um, fluid is being, uh, is being exchanged against air to make the eye completely stable and the air is then over 24 hours is being then replaced by uh, the natural fluid that the, the body is forming. The patient is, uh, is then um, kept in bed just for one day. The eye is completely stable, no suture needed, uh, and the uh, patient was happy. This was a, a, a surgical procedure in general anesthesia because the patient wanted to be under general anesthesia. It doesn't have to be under general anesthesia. So that was the first gene therapy ever conducted uh, in the eye in Switzerland. I would like to, uh, to uh, go to the next chapter of my presentation, namely attitudes toward gene editing, in this case uh, of healthcare professionals. There was an uh, anonymous uh, online survey to assess the attitude of members of genetics uh, professional societies worldwide, uh, and uh, the um, responses showed that uh, virtually all respondents were supportive of somatic editing in base basic science, pretty much exactly 100%, and clinical research, almost 90%, on non-reproductive human cells. Only ab about more than a half, uh, namely 57%, uh, were supportive of uh, germline editing basic science, and a third or so supported the transfer of viable embryos to humans for clinical research. When we get to the support toward, towards future clinical uses of somatic gene editing, most favored uh, the future therapeutic use of somatic uh, uh, editing, again, almost 100%, but there was significantly less support for diseases with lower penetrance, later age of onset, less significant impact on the lifespan, and lesser degree of disability due to the condition. There was little support for enhancement in somatic cells, only, a 13, only 13%. When we get to germline editing, the picture is similar, but the uh, acceptance rates are lower. There was pretty much three quarters of the, uh, of the respondents that uh, favored the future therapeutic use of germline editing. Again, as with somatic uh, gene editing, there was significantly less support for diseases with lower penetrance, later age of onset, less significant impact on lifespan, and lesser degree of disability. And there was very low support, less than 10%, for enhancement using uh, germline editing. Last but not least, we should uh, let the patient speak, as uh, Dr. Stutzky rightly uh, mentioned uh, earlier. So what are the attitudes toward gene editing of patients? This is again due to a, a, a secondary to a survey. Attitudes toward blindness are actually impacted by um, 
the, uh, will impact the views towards gene editing when investigating the attitudes of medical professionals and people with disabilities towards somatic, somatic gene editing, it was found that individuals with disabilities raise actually a broader range of ethical concerns than professionals, including issues surrounding identity and the positive value of uh, disability. It is clear that the only reliable way to learn how individuals with a particular disability view their disability and what their attitude might be towards treating or curing it is to actually ask them, which researchers and bioethicists have often failed to do. The views of people with inherited retinal conditions towards gene editing are likely to be different than those of people with other conditions since the disability experiences of those with sensory impairments like blindness differ in many ways from those of people with other types of disabilities such as intellectual disabilities, mobility impairments or chronic illness. Factors such as stigma, accessibility, the existence of community and physical pain can vary greatly between disabilities and are likely to influence views. All participants in, a, in this recent survey I'm presenting saw potential benefits of gene editing. Their attitudes towards gene editing for visual conditions, however, diverged in ways uh, that were informed by their lived experience with and attitudes towards blindness. When, when it comes to weighing of the potential risks and benefits, patients stress the remaining uncertainty about what the risks and benefits entail and are able to articulate uh, trade-offs that they are and are not willing to make. Many, many parents indicate their support would depend upon the level of risk involved, particularly if there was any chance it could potentially exacerbate disease severity or would only partially impact their medical condition. So this is a quote out of this survey. The question I think for me would ultimately come down to a lot of details. One is the cost, another is the treatment procedures, the risk, the downside risk as well as the upside potential. And then that whether it's something I'd have to repeatedly, to do repeatedly or it's like this one time thing because I do have some vision at this point in time, if there is a risk I could, I could lose what I have, that would be a factor. I think if it's a few thousand dollars, I would be much more inclined to seriously consider it than if it were a six-figure cost. And if you're talking about only a marginal increase in my vision, then I might be much less inclined than if you're talking about a large enough increase that it would have a meaningful impact on the functional utility of the vision I have. It was also found that the age of onset of blindness impacts the views toward gene editing. Subjects who became blind in adolescence or adulthood generally feel more negative toward being blind and the impacts it has on their lives than those who have been blind since birth or childhood and are less likely to think of blindness as a fundamental part of their identity. Subjects with later onset progressive vision loss emphasize the stress of continually adapting to changes in their vision. A significant number express particular interest in gene editing to prevent further vision loss, even if they had adjusted to the amount of vision they currently have. Again, a quote. There's this argument of, if you could get your vision back, would you? And a lot of people would say they wouldn't. I think those are for people who are born blind. If you are born blind, you kind of didn't lose anything. Another quote, I have friends who have been blind since birth that have no desire if they were cues or anything like that because this is their life. They have known it, whereas somebody like me, I would really love to at least stop it where it's at. Not to say I can't live as a fully blind person, but if I have the chance, I would love to stop it right where it's at. And I would like to close with a quote of a patient who sees no conflict between accepting or even embracing blindness in his or her own life and curing or preventing it through gene editing. I think that science is there to be used and whatever challenges we are faced with should be accepted by each individual. But at the same time, if there is a technology or a scientific solution out there that can improve that, why not use it? 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. This uh, clinical experience, uh, what is the meaning to meet the patient and uh, to analyze the, the attitude, the impact, uh, the hopes, and in which way to include uh, this kind of gene therapy for these problems. So please, uh, um, questions, uh, remarks, uh, just uh, Comte, Michel, uh, please. Michel, the microphone, you can Michel. The microphone, yeah. Okay. Uh, again, uh, this is a, a problem uh, of quantity, and it might be uh, a question of ethics. Uh, I've traveled in uh, in certain areas in uh, in, in Africa after after conflict, and there are regions where the increase in this kind of not full blindness but this kind of shadow blindness is exponential. I don't know the exact number but the numbers have been rising very very sharply over the last 15 or 20 years and it is this, uh, it's, they call it I have a shadow and they walk like zombies, and uh, one of the places uh, you, you might visit one day is a, a refugee center called Kukuma, where there are several million refugees. And the increase in this blindness that you were talking about has been really exponential in that area, but almost zero treatment have as we discussed yesterday, because maybe of the cooling and of the medicine available. Uh, how come in that continent has been so little improvement, and how come these numbers are raising, rising so ex exponentially? Okay. It's a very important point. Um, and Thank when you. we look at the uh, prevalence figures of the WHO in blindness, uh, there is a big discrepancy between uh, developing countries and uh, fully developed countries, actually a, a huge discrepancy. Uh, the major driver of blindness worldwide is the um, increased life expectancy. So, it, so that increase is not driven by poverty in the third world, um, but more driven by the increase of life expectancy because most conditions um, that lead to blindness are number one retinal and second degenerative such as age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma or the secondary causes of myopia as an example. Yeah? Myopia as such is simply short-sightedness but the consequences of myopia in the developed countries especially in East Asia will become the number one cause of blindness by the year 2050. Yeah, that is clearly a consequence of, let's say, uh, a, a positive development of, of mankind, namely that we can live so long, and also we study, and every, uh, every half year of study uh, leads to an increase of myopia of uh, point, point, uh, 0.1, 0.2 uh, diopters, right? So <laughs> uh, don't ask why I don't wear glasses, but um, uh, joking aside, so the... the <laughs> These, <laughs> joking aside, so these these um, these developments are dichotomous, right, between developing and fully developed countries. When we get to uh, the de uh, developing countries, we need co completely different means to to distribute therapies to the population. But it's mostly related to their uh, hygiene that they have and their uh, life standard, it would immediately improve if their life standard would improve. Thank you. Uh, another short question or short reply. Uh, otherwise, uh, we go on with uh, uh, thank you again. Uh, Scholl. Scholl. And uh, probably that uh, is a, a 
the last uh, speaker open the door also for the for the last uh, uh, contribution coming from Tim Hunt and uh, the role of uh, uh, corporations in this area. So when we enter in the, this view, uh, especially in some countries and in which way to translate the translation into the population and the, what is the specific uh, um, role and the responsibility of uh, co uh, corporation. Please, uh, Dr. Hunt. Thank you very much, uh, Monsignor. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks for having me at this uh, fine forum. I appreciate it a great deal. Um, my name is Tim Hunt. I'm the chief executive officer at a group called the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. I've spent about uh, 20 years in the biotechnology field. And uh, three weeks ago, I did something different with my career, which is I joined a nonprofit organization, which is the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. More on that in a moment. I'm also, uh, in my spare time, I'm the ethics committee chair at an organization called the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, yeah, so just a moment on my organization. So it's a non-governmental organization, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. We have about 450 members. We're only focused on the gene therapy and cell therapy world. Gene editing is part of that. Um, we are made up of biotechnology companies, some very large academic medical centers and research centers, uh, organizations that are involved in various types of tools to support the gene and cell therapy space, and patient organizations. And our focus is really on engaging with major stakeholders in, a, in, our, in our version of that is, you know, through a mix of education, listening, providing data and analytics. Um, we are very strong proponents of clear regulation, clear and strong regulation in the field. Uh, we're focused on addressing one of the major barriers to actually producing and developing gene therapy and cell ther therapies, which is barriers in manufacturing. Um, and then I'll talk about it in a little bit. We're very focused as well on patient access through how to, how to think about modernizing uh, access and reimbursement systems for these highly disruptive technologies, new technologies. So some data. And this is all related to some of the good news in the field. Um, one of the companies I worked for earlier in my career was very focused on antibiotic research and development. And um, as we know, we have a large superbug crisis going around the globe. I can tell you from firsthand experience and, and some friends that are still in that space, it is a, one of the big problems we have is we have a shortage of suppliers trying to make antibiotics. There are very, very few companies that are in that space. For years, I would use the gene therapy and cell therapy space as the counterpoint to that. There is a, there has been an explosion of biotech companies and important biomedical research centers and hospitals that are doing real world clinical research in this field. And that is terrific. By our count, there's almost 1,400 across the globe, led by North America, uh, but with major contributions from Europe as well and Asia and a few from other parts of the world. Over the last year, that number has grown slightly in the United States. It's remained stable in Europe and has grown tremendously in Asia. Some more good news on the data front. There are over 2,000 clinical trials that are currently going on within the gene and cell therapy space. That's great news. There's almost 800 in phase one clinical trials, a little over 1,100 in phase two trials. That's very important. And I would say, until I was told this summer, late this summer, that there were this many clinical trials, I would never have guessed there were 200 going on in phase three clinical trials in gene and cell therapy. That is, these numbers together represent, I would submit, a very real and proximate wave of approvals that will be coming, especially to Europe and the United States, but also to Asia 
in the near future. I've got some more data on that, but that's an important thing to keep in mind. There is a wave of approvals that are coming. And, and therefore, you know, a lot of regulators and payers need to think about this, this reality that's coming in. It's been a, a meaningful beginning, but by comparison, it has been a trickle, and now we have a wave coming our way, which is great news. A little more data. When you break out the clinical trials, this is a graph that shows trials that were going on in 2021 and now 2022, right? You see the distribution. Many going on in North America and Asia in phase one. Actually, comparatively, smaller than I would have thought in Europe. I don't yet understand why. I've asked the question. I've gotten a few theories, but I don't know that we've nailed that why. Why exactly uh, so few in phase one? When you look at phase two, you know, distribution, again, North America, Asia Pacific, and Europe, and then the phase three trials, pretty much even, right across the board, which is great to see. And then earlier this year, more great news, right? We've seen new therapies approved. That's over on the left column, three new gene and cell therapies approved. And then on the right, it's sort of therapies that have, been, have seen new approvals in new geographies or new indications. And on the left side, you, know, you see, very, I would argue, very important therapies like Roctavian from Biomarin that was approved in August in Europe. That is a treatment for hemophilia A that could be incredibly important for that community. Uh, I believe there is, uh, Biomarin has something like six years of data from patients. It goes out six years, which is terrific. And they're actively engaging now in discussion with payers, health technology assessors and payers, to try to make that product available in Asia, which is great. So good news with new approvals and new indications. This is another good glimpse of the wave that's very proximate. So if you take the previous chart and this chart, it is an example of new approvals um, that, are, that either have taken place or this chart shows anticipated. This is between September of this year, so this month forward through the end of 2022, and then includes all of 2023. These are expected approvals. In the purple, you see uh, expected approvals for the United States. And in the orange, you see European approvals that are anticipated. And when you take them all together, you'll see it's about 20, a little over 20 products, 21 products that are expected to be approved over this two-year period of time. Again, great news for patients, right? And projected forward, you see the FDA and the EMA in a few years are expecting at least somewhere between 10 and 20 approvals a year. More good news. I'm bringing a lot of good news today. Um, there are six CAR-T therapies that are available in the United States and Europe. It's expected that next year we will see the first CRISPR-approved product. Uh, I, I believe that is the product from Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics for the treatment of sickle cell disease. It's in late-stage trials now. There's a hope that that will get approved next year, which would be amazing. Uh, another form of gene editing called base editing, sort of a second generation, has already entered the clinic. Great news. And then we're seeing um, off-the-shelf uh, cancer therapeutics and in vivo therapies continue in advance. It's just more and more development of the underlying technology, um, which is great progress. And then finally, now we're starting to see work being done on some prevalent diseases. So on many different fronts, we're seeing the pipeline for these transform transformational therapies really accelerating. Well, why is that so important? You know, we've sort of touched on it. We've talked about it a little bit. But the unfortunate reality is for too many of our patients, millions, tens of millions all around the globe, the status quo represents death or serious disability, right? For far too many of our patients, that is the plight. And so there is a sense of urgency, I believe, in the field to keep pushing the envelope and trying to make these therapies 
available for our patients. We think of it as that's our North Star. We can't lose sight of that. That's our mission, that's our big mission, to get up every day to try to translate exciting science for one purpose only, to make therapies available to help patients for whom the status quo too often represents death or serious disability. So we want to challenge the status quo and disrupt the status quo. That's what these therapies are all about. And we've, we've talked about this over the past couple of days, but I thought maybe just to, you know, to bring it back, just to one more, one more look. You know, a lot of health systems are built around te technology, older technology, right? They treat chronic, they're basically chronic care treatments, right? They address symptoms of diseases, right? These are oftentimes pills or early biologics that are administered regularly over a patient's lifetime, right? They are taken daily or they are taken weekly. Sometimes they're taken monthly, right? The costs are amortized over the lifetime of the patient, right? Unless they have find, find some intervention that's going to be curative, surgery or something else, right? So the, the costs are spent, are paid out over many years. And the outcomes are, they've been meaningful. They've looked, they've, they've transformed patients' lives to, to date, right? They're very important but they tend to last for short periods, and again, repeat dosing is needed. This new wave of regenerative medicines, gene and cell therapy products that are coming along upend this status quo, right? They get at the root cause of diseases. They are, you know, I like to say they are durable in effect um, first, because for example, you know, in my previous life, uh, when I was at Etas Medicine, a gene editing company, we used to say these therapies may be durable because in some cases you may not uh, be able to cure someone's blindness as, as, um, as Hendrik could tell people far better than me, but you might improve people's vision, right, which is meaningful. You might go from I can perceive light to now I can see as a child the face of my parents. It's, it's transformative, right? but that person might not be able to drive an automobile. So I think we have to be very careful in the language we use, that we don't promise things like cures when, in fact, the reality is that may sometimes not be the case. But both things can be true. It can also be true that there are some therapies that appear to be, in the early days, <clears throat> curative and have a very long, durable effect, which is great. The cost for these therapies can be significant. There's a lot that goes into making them. Um, Hendrik just showed us the 20-year journey for Luxderna, and that is very common from the earliest research until an actual approval, and of course that comes with hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, in research and development costs and countless failures along the way. And then, as I mentioned, the, the, the benefit can last for many, many years, have a durable effect, and sometimes possibly the lifetime of the patient, which is terrific. But of course, disrupting the status quo is never easy. It's not easy on the side of the science. It's not easy on the side of payers and other health systems, right? I mentioned these are long, complex ventures. And oftentimes, as Luke has mentioned and others have mentioned, these are very small patient populations that we're sometimes pursuing. The existing frameworks, the status quo, is really built around these pills, these biologics that manage chronic care. They don't tend to recognize long-term cost savings to the healthcare systems of these durable, potentially curative therapies. And some of these assessment bodies, frankly, don't always um, look at other areas that are really important, like quality of life, if you improve blindness, for example. Um, so our view is we need to modernize, just like the therapies have been modernized, the health systems need to evolve and modernize to keep up with this important new technology to think about how do we finance these things over time that is both sustainable for the health systems and the developers? <clears throat> you know, we've talked a lot about ethics over the last few days, but I've got the final microphone for the final session of the final day. Um, so I want to talk about it just for a moment, too. The, look, it's, it's got to be, it's super important to developing these products and develop, developing them the right way. If you think about opportunities, as I've mentioned, the technology is advancing tremendously. That's great news. <clears throat> but 
we need, we have and we need stringent regulatory standards around the globe, right, to develop these things the right way and protect patient safety. We as an organization have also put out a code of conduct, we believe this is super important, to really focus on proper oversight and proper patient safety. There are obvious challenges on the ethical side as well of developing technology, in, including in our space, right? There are lots of unregulated stem cell clinics that sell hope to patients in need with thin science and that are really not regulated whatsoever. That is, that's a great challenge in many corners of the globe. Um, we've talked a lot about access for patients all around the globe, whether it's in developed, it's not easy in developed countries, as I just articulated. It is much more difficult in developing countries. It's something we've got to work on, I believe, as, as a field um, together with lots of stakeholders. And we talked uh, earlier in today and yesterday also about those important boundaries between addressing disease and enhancing life. And we've also touched on some of these rogue actors um, that look at pursuing unethical, unregulated applications. I was actually in Hong Kong in November of 2018 for what was supposed to be a fairly sleepy gathering, the second international genome editing conference, um, and it was anything but. And I would say for um, some of our scientific founders, when I was at Editas Medicine and I that were there, and a few of my other colleagues, we've talked about it over the years, it was a searing event that we will never forget. To hear the news at first, and then a few days later hear, to hear Dr. Hey, get up and actually talk about these CRISPR gene editing twins was um, something I think many of us will never forget. At the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, we pivoted fairly quickly and put out a statement of principles related to gene editing with a real focus on germline editing. And just in brief, we stated the regulated somatic cell gene editing, you know, it really has tremendous potential and, we sh and it should be the primary focus for the development community. Germline editing is, is not appropriate in the, in, the, in the human clinical setting at all. There are a lot of legal, uh, uh, safety, ethical, legal, and societal issues involved with germline editing, much of which we've talked about already, that need, that are yet un, unresolved, and unless and until those get wrangled down to the ground, it's not appropriate for germline editing to proceed forward. I do think these are global issues. They require a big tent discussion with lots and lots of, of people, including religious leaders, patients, scientists, physicians, biotechnology companies. And my last slide, I think it's always important that the patient has the last word. Um, I met this, the, this gentleman in the photo, Jimmy, a few weeks ago. Um, he is a sickle cell patient who, when you hear him tell his story, has incredibly had, still has sickle cell disease, but his, his sickle cell disease was incredibly complex. He was receiving regular IVs for, for hydration. He had pain crises on a continuous basis. As he tells it, he would end up in the hospital sometimes on a monthly basis for a few days. It was terrible. And as a general proposition, in the United States, the average sickle cell patient lasts about 45 years before they die. I admit he's the fourth sickle cell patient I've met, fifth sickle cell patient I have met in the past, call it seven years. Uh, three of the five have passed away in that time, which I find astounding. Um, thankfully, Jimmy got into a clinical trial with this CRISPR therapeutics vertex drug that I referred to that might get approved next year. He had an extremely favorable result from it, and today at least, he says he is not experiencing symptoms, and he, for all intents and purposes, other than routine checkups, is not doing anything special for his sickle cell disease, which is pretty amazing to see. So I like to have, let the patient have the last word, so with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for this presentation.
Uh, please, uh, if there are uh, questions or clarification or remarks, uh, please, uh, there. So, um, two questions for, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't even, I have Hunter, such Timur. bad sight, actually, maybe you could help me. <laughs> um, but for, for, the, for the last speaker, um, th there's been a shift from volume to value in the United States in terms of how insurance is compensated, and I wonder if that, if gene therapies could really be favored under such a model since the goal, uh, since compensation is paid in proportion to the, the quality of the health outcome. Um, and second, for these diseases which don't have uh, a cure or some measure of a cure in terms of uh, sickle cell gene therapy, you know, would, would be an exception to this, but other diseases that cause immense suffering for which there aren't really any um, therapies on the horizon, how, uh, what is coming, do you think, in terms of uh, being able to replace opioids, for instance, to, to relieve suffering? This kind of riffs on my own <laughs> interests, obviously. Yeah, let me take them in reverse order. I, I'm not... I'm not sure around what is really coming by way to replace opioids. It's sort of outside the sphere of my knowledge. Not, I don't think of it really as so much in the gene and cell therapy space. Uh, I know in biotechnology there is, there is work being done on different pathways. Um, how that will actually translate in the long run I think is a little unclear. I think it's a NAV something pathway. Yeah, there's some work being done. I, I, I do know of some companies that are doing some work on it, but I'd say it's, it's very early stage. There may, be, there, may be, um, there may be work that's further on that I'm aware of. So I'm, that's the best I can kind of do on the pain side of it. Uh, remind me, the first, oh, the first part was on the push to value in the United States, and how does that ripple through now with gene and cell therapies? Yeah, so I think it's, I think as I kind of articulated, it fits fist and glove with the new wave of gene and cell therapy programs that are coming. So for example, there's a lot around value-based contracting that's being looked at in the United States and Europe, where there's a few different forms of it, but um, uh, biotech companies will say, you know, listen, let's try um, either um, seeing if this therapy will work over the span of five years and will amortize the cost over five years, for example, um, if, the, if it stops working after year two or three, the payments stop. It's not a bad deal. Uh, there, there isn't, you don't see a lot of that in other settings. There's no surgical value-based payments that I'm aware of. Uh, there, there are um, stem cell transplants, bone marrow transplants. They're up front. Whether it works or not, it's over. So I think it's a pretty good, it's a pretty reasonable approach that we're all trying to take now that we want to work for payers, biotech companies, institutions, patients, and, and others. And I think that's a, a good example. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, we could conclude uh, this very interesting panel. That was a, a kind of a bridge so between the end of the conference and the future of uh, our uh, discussion, meeting, and uh, in which way we are able to go on with this uh, dialogue between science and uh, humanities to see together in which way to offer criteria, perspective, and development in these uh, uh, fields. So uh, many thanks to uh, all five speakers of uh, this panel. And uh, uh, also, we conclude uh, now a little bit of in earlier, five minutes, so, uh, <laughs> so perfect, uh, kind of Swiss uh, style. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we uh, conclude the first international conference on ethics of engineering life. And so many thanks uh, to the speakers. of uh, this uh, panel, but also uh, many thanks to all the speakers and chairs of these two days. 
and all the participants uh, that uh, stay with us yesterday and uh, today online with a lot of interest uh, uh, to participate and uh, looking for the future, uh, look forward a meeting in presence all together because of course in presence is a more useful, nice and uh, fruitful uh, to discuss of many of these uh, uh, issues. But of course it was really a challenge after two years uh, to uh, organize the meeting. Yes, of course. And uh, so uh, we uh, really uh, express my gratitude to all the people that uh, work a lot to organize the meeting and the technical support uh, and the people from the academy, Gaetano, Fabrizio, and other people of the staff. And uh, we conclude uh, with uh, the voice from Africa because probably the future comes from that uh, a young continent with a lot of problems and also with a lot of hopes and dreams and challenges. So uh, Simporé is uh, connected. So Professor Simporé, last word from uh, Burkina Faso, please. Thank you very much. We had a problem with connection. And uh, first, uh, I had a meeting with our president of the university. That is why I asked my assistant to, to read uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you. It is a very, very beautiful, uh, interesting uh, meeting. Uh, thank you very much for having Thank you, Professor Simpore. <laughs> and uh, we, we keep in touch also for the future. So now, Ralph, if you wanted to say something, and uh, we say goodbye to all participants online. And we have the coffee break. Of course. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much um, for these last words during the conference. And I would just like to add, uh, in name of the, uh, on behalf of the NCCR Molecular Systems Engineering, uh, once again, thank you very much for your hospitality. Uh, the feedback has been so positive from all the speakers that we've received so far. So it did play a, uh, a big role, the special venue the religious atmosphere, the philosophical atmosphere, the scientific input, um, and I think we all together are on a good way. It was a great start, and hopefully there will be another second conference somewhere in the future. Thank you very much, you all. Thank you. <laughs>